and then count to 25. Can't do that. Hand your Bible to someone and find out if they can. Or if you're just interested in whether people can count to 25, hand them your Bible and see what they do. My dad had a guy who used to work for him. He couldn't read. I'm not making this up, but it was true. His name was Delbert. And we were working on something, always working on things together. Dad said, well, what does it say, Delbert? He says, I can't read, you dummy. Exodus 25. <laughs> I can't read, you dummy. He's a pretty smart guy, too. I don't know he was. So if you ever hear me say, I can't read, you dummy, you know what I'm talking about, I'm referencing. Okay. Verse 1 of Exodus 25, the Bible says, The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering. Of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart, ye shall take my offering. And this is the offering which ye shall take of them, gold and silver and brass, and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and ram skin dyed red and badger skins and shittim wood and oil for the light, spices for anointing oil and for sweet incense. Onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. According to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. Father, this evening, I ask that you would help us as we look at this offering that you wanted from Israel to see the heart of God and what pleases you and what you do as a result. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Did the Israel that was led from Egypt ever please God? Sometimes. <laughs> I like to ask questions that nobody knows what, what kind of answer does he want. And then you say, they're wrong. yeah, sometimes they did, actually. Sometimes they please God. Matter of fact... Lest we get so down on them, could I remind you that we really know the things that were major events that they displeased God. But that God used them. Did you know God used complaining, bitter, angry Israel? God used their lives. He used them to raise up the next generation and even did things that were miracles. I know we got feedback right now, but Tony's not in here. Let me yell for him real quick, guys. Ready plug your ears. See him coming? If you don't want to hear a loud noise, you plug your ears now. Okay. Tony! <laughs> we have feedback in the sound system. I don't think he heard me. All right, he'll take care of it now. We'll be good to go. But no, they didn't always displease God. They did not always, at every time, in every occasion, displease God. Some, oh, there, it fixed it completely. I could have done that. I got a switch right here for doing that. <laughs> all right. Uh, they did not, at all times, in every instance, displease God. Matter of fact, probably I would say a majority of the time they actually pleased God in their lives. And so sometimes it's good to remember this and to remember that there were good examples. In Israel, I think it was a good example when Israel cried out to God. It's a good example. You know, you say, Pastor, the reason they cried out to God was because of the terrible situation they were in in their bondage. Friend, everyone is in a terrible situation. And anyone who cries out to God will be the person that gets the help from God. And they were a great example of that. Uh, too often, and many times, you see it even in Christians, too often individuals think they don't need God for anything. And consequently, God doesn't do anything in their life and doesn't use their life in anyone else's life because they don't know how needy they are. When you come to a place when you recognize God, I'm a wreck. And I need help. And you acknowledge that and you just simply cry out to God, God will do great things. But this evening I want to look at an example of something that God used in the life of Israel and something that pleased God. And it was an area of offering. It's interesting that one of the things that God wanted from Israel was the right kind of attitude, the right kind of worship. And here we see it this evening. Uh, the, the, Moses is told when he's on the mount, and by the way, this is the, this is the group of events where God gives his law to Israel, and then in the end, when Moses comes down from the mount, 
God hears a noise of war in the camp. It sounded as though, and they're reveling and worshiping false gods. And then we, I've already seen God asking forgiveness. But go with me to Exodus chapter 35. So let's kind of go and pass all of this to the place where God has actually restored Israel. I want to look at verse 20. No, I'm sorry. Um, in verse 4, Moses spake, verse 30, chapter 35, verse 4, Moses spake unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord commanded, saying, Take ye from among you an offering unto the Lord. Whosoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it. An offering of the Lord, gold and silver and brass and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and ram skins dyed red and badger skin and shittim wood and oil for the light and spices for the anointing oil and for the sweet incense and onyx stones and stones to be set for the ephod and for the breastplate. And every wise hearted among you shall come and make all that the Lord hath commanded. Now I want to look at verse uh, 20. The Bible says, And all the congregation of the children of Israel departed from the presence of Moses, and they came, every one whose heart stirred him up, and every one whom his spirit made willing, and they brought the Lord's offering to the work of the tabernacle of the congregation for all his service, and for the holy garments. And they came, both men and women, as many as were willing-hearted, and brought bracelets, and earrings, and rings, and tablets, all jewels, they had tablets back then, we think they're new now. All jewels of gold, and every man that offered an offering of gold unto the Lord, and every man with whom was found blue and purple and scarlet, and fine linen, and goat's hair, and red skins of rams, and badger skins brought them. Everyone that did offer an offering of silver and brass brought the Lord's offering, and every man with whom was found shittim wood for any work of the service brought it. And all the women that were wise-hearted did spin with their hands and brought that which they had spun, both of blue and of purple and of scarlet and of fine linen. And all the women whose hearts stirred them up in wisdom spun goat's hair. And the rulers brought onyx stones and stones to be set for the ephod and for the breastplate and spice and oil for the light and for the anointing oil for the sweet incense. The children of Israel brought a willing offering unto the Lord. Every man and woman whose heart made them willing to bring for all manner of work which the Lord had commanded to be made by the hand of Moses. Now, friend, here in the Scripture, we find a wonderful example of what pleases God. What pleases God? Uh, sometimes we think that in the Old Testament, that God always required the tithe. He always required the 10%, and He required the first fruits, and He required, you know, that... Uh, that uh, every seven years that the Sabbath be set aside. And truly, if we were to read up to this point, we would see the sacrifices and the offerings that God required. But this is an exception to that in this circumstance. See, the children of Israel are getting ready to build a tabernacle, which until Solomon's temple was built, is the official place of worship for national Israel. And this tabernacle is going to be something. And by that, I mean it's really going to be, you look at the materials that were put into building the tabernacle, and you can understand this thing would be finer than anything that we would have seen with our eyes today. There wouldn't be anything in comparison with it, really, with regard to the materials with which it were built, provided that it was built well. You ever see good materials put to bad use? You ever see somebody take nice material, and then they just really mess the material up building something wrong or don't build things well? And that happens as well, but that certainly didn't happen here. But I want us this evening, I don't want to focus on, you know, the offering and everything that people gave, but I want us this evening to see what pleases God. See, as we're studying through Exodus, one of the things that we're focusing toward is we're looking at the heart of God. We're studying what pleases God. Christian, you and I know that New Testament examples of giving, the Bible talks about that having first a willing mind pleases God. You know that the scriptural command in the New Testament for offering, not for tithe, but for offering, is that we not give grudgingly or out of necessity, for the Lord giveth a cheerful giver. But here is an example of that, the same thing that we see in the Old Testament. I want to see how God blesses it. So the requirement when God told Moses to give this, he didn't say tell every person to give this. God said in verse, um, well, we can look at first in, in verse 35, in, in ver, I mean, chapter 35, verse 5, God said, whosoever is of a willing heart. That's what God told Moses to tell Israel. Whoever has a willing heart, let him bring it. 
Now that's a great distinction, isn't it? You ever had somebody give you something that they didn't want to give? I've gotten far past wanting people to give me things they don't want to give. I mean, it's just a reality. Uh, I don't like gifts where people feel, for whatever reason, like they're obligated to give you a gift. You know, it's like, well, you know what? <laughs> Family member, got to get them a gift. Or they invited me to a party, got to get them a gift. Or he did something for me, I've got to give them to a gift. You ever had a gift that, in a small sense, you felt as though the person gave you the gift because they wanted to repay something you'd done for them? And the cheapness of the gift that they gave you indicated the value that they had for what you'd done for them, or at least how much they valued you and what you'd done for them. Uh, I had a friend in seminary, and, and I hate to say it, but he, he just he, he seemed like a greedy person. And he was always trying to get me to work for him, and I didn't want to work for him. And um, he'd say, you know, I'll pay you such and so an hour to, to work. And I told him, I said, that's not what I'm into. That's not what I do. I may be able to do that, but that's not my trade. It's, I'm a preacher. And uh, it's not that I don't want to do this sort of thing, but there's no end to, to doing things you possibly could do. You know, I know how to do enough things that I could be very busy doing things that have nothing to do with the ministry all the time. And so uh, he was always trying to get me to into some scheme to make money. And then every now and again, just to be kind to him, I, I'd do him a favor and I'd work on something. But I didn't want to get paid. The reason I want to get paid was I didn't want to be obligated in the sense that he'd ask me to do it again. And then he, <laughs> the, the rascal would try to pay me you know, I mean, you do something that's worth, I'm not going to say, I don't know what the dollar amount, but, but he tried to pay you about a tenth of what it would cost if you had to pay, really pay someone to do the work. And I always felt like I was an insult. I'd far rather somebody just took what I did for them for free than try to pay me a tenth of what it's worth. You understand what I'm saying? In other words, it's a, it's a grudging attitude. The payment is a grudging attitude. I remember one time I did him a favor. He, had, he would needed something done for someone else. And I did it for the cost of material, and he argued with me about what the material cost. You know, and, and you know, I'm thinking, well, you know something, I did it for free, but now you want me to pay out of pocket to work for you. You know, and did it really cost that much? Do we, you know, do you think you'd cut me a break on that somehow? So I'm just saying, I don't want anything to do with you. Why? Because of your attitude, right? You know some people would do anything for you. And those kind of people you'd do anything for as well, wouldn't you? Now, here are people... And God said to Moses, God said, well, I'm gonna, I want a tabernacle built. Now let me ask you a question. Who was the tabernacle for? And it's not a trick question. You can answer it either way and be right. Okay, who was the tabernacle for? Yeah. I mean, honestly, it was a place that was to represent the presence of God. And God's presence, if the cloud came over the tabernacle after everything was finished. But it was built for the children of Israel. In other words, God said, build this, and I'll dwell with you. Who benefits from having God with them? <laughs> Obviously, the people who have God with them. God doesn't need a place to live, my friend. He's not hard up. It wasn't as though he said, you know, if I could just get near these people, maybe some of their good mojo would rub off. <laughs> the reality of it is, is that the, the, the fact is they needed God. They needed His protection. They needed His holy presence. And so God said, tell the people who want to give willingly, that have a willing heart to give. Okay? And then we saw what happened. They did. And here we chalk it up to the children of Israel setting a great example of how to give. Now let's look at what God did. In verse 30, the Bible says, I'm in chapter 35 still, And Moses said to the children of Israel, See, the Lord hath called by name... Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And he hath filled him with the Spirit of God, in wisdom, in understanding, and in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship. Now I want to look at verse 34. And the Bible says, And he hath put in his heart that he may teach both he and Ahaliah, the son of Ahisamach, of the tribe of Dan, them hath he filled with wisdom of heart, to work all manner of work, of workmen and of the embroiderer in blue and in purple and scarlet and in fine linen, of the weaver, even of them that do any work, and of those that devise cunning work. Then wrought Bezalel and Aholiah, and every wise hearted man, in whom the Lord put wisdom and understanding to know how to work all manner of work for the service of the sanctuary, according to all that the Lord had commanded him. 
And Moses called Bezalel and Ahaliah, and every wise-hearted man in whose heart the Lord had put wisdom, upon every one whose heart stirred him up to come unto the work to do it. Verse 5 of chapter 36, the Bible said, They spake unto Moses, saying, The Lord bring much more, or the people bring much more than enough for the service of the work which the Lord commanded to make. And Moses gave commandment, and they caused to be proclaimed throughout the camp, saying, Let neither man nor woman make any more work for the offering of the sanctuary. So the people were restrained from bringing. <laughs> Can you imagine this? I, 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 remember, I remember reading this when I was probably six or seven years old and the impression it made on me. It still makes the same impression. And I, um, and I don't know if it was a Becca book curriculum, but I remember being in kindergarten and having this story taught. And I remember the pictures, and they showed like a chest with people putting coins in, and they had red coins, or like a copper-colored red and gold and all that. I remember the picture in my mind. And then I remember seeing like a picture of a chain that looked kind of like what they put at the bank, you know, to stop people from going up until it's their turn. And it showed like a block there to keep people from getting to the, to the offering box because they wouldn't stop giving. I just, it is, to me it's amazing. Can you imagine? <laughs> Could you imagine if the work of the Lord today had the problem of people that were giving more than we could use? I mean, we just, just couldn't put it to good use. And, it was, and it's really just such a nuisance that you have to restrain people. And in my mind, you know, I see the cop from Texas, you know, who handcuffed the girl the other day. You know, somebody's trying to sneak in and put money in the offering box, and he, I'm joking about that. <laughs> right. But puts them down, handcuffs them, get out of here. You know, you're not giving today. We don't need any more. Stop giving your gold and your, you know, the work of your hands and all these things. Now, Christian, I want to ask a question. What provoked that kind of a circumstance? That's an amazing situation, isn't it? You ever ask yourself, what caused people to be like that? What made things so that it came to a point that there was too much, there was too many, much riches given to the temple? They couldn't handle it anymore. They couldn't use it anymore. It became a problem so much so that it was actually hindering the workmen. They couldn't get their job done because they're dealing with people coming around trying to give them more material, valuable material. I mean, gold is not like something, you know, that, you know, you know too much gold. You know, it's not really a problem you have very much. It's not the sort of material. It's like, well, it's low quality, low grade, you know, or, or uh, you know, all of these things. These are riches that they're giving, and they're giving to build the tabernacle. I said the temple a minute ago, I think, I meant the tabernacle. As they're giving these things, the question is, what caused that? Well, I think we see that, we, I think this, the key we find is in verse uh, 5, whosoever is of a willing heart. Whosoever is of a willing heart. Friend, it has not changed. It's never been any different. God loves a, willfully, a willing heart. Just loves a willing heart. And you know what will happen if you, ever, if you ever practice this, you ever try this in your life? And by the way, Chris, you think God is interested in finances? The answer is yes. See, I'm asking all the hard questions just so Eddie will say the wrong answer. The answer is yes. God does care about finances because God cares about everything, doesn't he? Is God concerned about finances, though? Say no. He shook his head. You're right. No. He's not concerned about it. Why? Because God owns everything, and he has control of everything. He can do what he wants with it. We've got to come up with, like, a neutral answer. Maybe. <laughs> now, the fact is, is that God does care about it, but it isn't all that God cares about. And here are individuals, and let me ask you a question. In their lifetimes, how many of them would have been able to spend their gold? Where were they located? The wilderness. I mean, they could have sold their gold to each other. You know, hey, got some extra mana left over? You know, give me some, give me some gold. I'll give you some mana. I like them sandals, the ones you've been wearing for about 40 years now. Right. Wonder if you might sell them to me for some. You see, you see where I'm going with this? In other words, they weren't buying and selling in the wilderness. And if they died, they could be buried with it, and it really wouldn't help them any. The reality is, and you say, Pastor, okay, so it was worthless to them. They just they just gave it away because it's worthless. I don't think that's true at all. They had a lot of it. 
They spoiled Egypt. Literally, they brought wealth to Egypt, and when God took them out of Egypt, they took the wealth out of Egypt. Egypt got left with the pyramids. <laughs> That's it. They took the gold. You, you say, Pastor, is there gold in the pyramids? No. The Israelites took it all when they left. Uh, <laughs> they took the good stuff. Uh, I, I'm joking about that just a little bit, but it really is true. That they took the they took the, the spoil out of Egypt. They they took everything when they left, and they had a lot. And evidently, they had so much that even after they gave the Lord all that was needed for the tabernacle, they still had more to give. But honestly, Christian, that isn't the point. The point isn't what would they have done with it anyway. And the point isn't that they had so much it was easy for them to give. By the way, that is probably one of the most untrue statements ever. The statement that, well, if I had a lot, I'd give a lot. I have found, statistically speaking, and I'm not the only one that thinks this, I've found that those that have a lot maybe give a lot compared to those that have very little, but they give very little compared to those who have a little and give a lot i found that the biggest givers are not the people that have the most. They're the people that have a willing heart. You know, you have a willing heart, you can give to God. But I want us to see what happened here. See, my concern here would be, what if I were one of the people that had less to give? You ever ask that question? What if I were one of the people that had less to give? It was a privilege. It's a privilege to give to God. Do you know that? My question is, what if I don't have as much as someone else has to give? You know, God didn't mention how much anyone had when He asked them to give. He asked for people that had a willing heart to give. And the Bible said they gave with a willing heart. And all these things happened so much that they gave more than was needed. But then what I love to see in the Scripture is what God did. And Christian, if you can grasp this, this is a principle about God that will change your life. It will it'll make you go from lacking... To abundance in your life. I mean, I'm seriously telling you the truth. It's a fact. You have a heart that desires to give God whatever it is that you can. And by the way, I don't mean whatever it is that you're capable of giving. I'm talking about whatever it is that you have permission from God to give. And there's a difference, isn't there? You know, if God will let you, you ought to be willing to give Him everything. If God will let you, you should be like the folks from Macedonia that to their power they were willing and beyond their power. They were willing, and God gave them the grace to be able to do it. But see, in verse 31, the Bible said about this man Bezalel, the son of Uri, and her, or the son of her, the tribe of Judah, God had filled him with the spirit of God and wisdom and understanding and knowledge and all manner of workmanship. We saw in verse 25 of Exodus 35, all the women that were wise-hearted did spin with their hands. In other words, they had this heart. Now, you know what the word wise is in the Old Testament? It's the word hakbah. And it simply means skillful, skilled. Uh, it's not just smart. It is skilled. You ever see somebody that's smart, but they're not the kind of smart that you can really get anything done with? Not practically smart. They're smart. They're intelligent. But they're, you ever met somebody and everybody, you, you know, you think you call it what you call it sometimes a street smart. But I mean, it's just like everything they touch seems to turn to gold. And in this situation... Everything that these people did turned out better than they would have been able to do in their own strength. So the Bible said about in, that Bezalel and Ahaliah and every wise-hearted man, notice the next phrase in chapter 36, verse 1, in whom the Lord put wisdom and understanding to know how. And then after that, the, uh, the description is to work in all, all manner of work for the service of the sanctuary. Now I want you to notice this. Did you know that it is in the character of God to enable you to do what He wants you to do? Uh, how many Christians meet biblical commands with excuses? And what they usually say is, I don't, what are the next two words? Know how. I don't know how. Well, I would do that. I would witness to people, but I don't know how. It's not really something I'm good at. Well, Pastor, I know this needs to be done around the church and, you know, I wish somebody would do it and I would do it, but I don't know how. It's interesting that these are individuals who had the possessions, but those materials that they possessed weren't anything really of any particular use or value. 
Because what good is gold, honestly, if you don't use it for something? I mean, it's great when it's in an iPhone, right? It's great when it's in some electronics. It makes the electronics work. It's really good, you know, when you got your big chain around your neck, you know, if you need one of those. <laughs> it's great when you got a wedding ring. You know, gold that's being used is good, but what about when you have gold and you and what do you do with gold if it's not being used? If you're not actually using it, what do you do with it? What? Make it make an idol, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What? You guard it. That's what you do. You know what people do with gold? Well, they try to keep other people from taking it from them. <laughs> Honestly, they lock it up, they, put, they guard it. They try to stop someone from taking it from them. And all it becomes is a possession that possesses them. And now these individuals have given their valuables to the Lord, and God took them and He enabled them to have the wisdom and the cunning to make things. Gave them the skill to make things. And they didn't have that before. Now let me ask you a question. Were they in better shape when they had their possessions or were they in better shape when they gave them to the Lord? Friend, I don't care what you have. When you give it to the Lord, God will do more with it. I want to, I want to say two things about that. I want to give, describe two ways you could do that and then I'll be finished. We don't have a temple today. Matter of fact, the Old Testament tithing system, it's not null and void. The principle of the tithe is never been abolished. But we don't have a Levitical priesthood today and we don't have a temple system today to tithe to. You understand that? The church is not the Israel. The church is not the temple. And so we don't give to them. Now can we give? Can we give to the ministry? Yeah, that's the New Testament precedent. Give to the ministry. Give to the ministers to give to the people. But we really give to, to serve others. That's what we give for today. So understand, friend, that probably, probably God doesn't want you to take everything you have and put it in the offering plate. Can we agree on that this evening? I don't want to get extreme about it or use examples, but I just want to make a general statement that I believe is universally pretty much true. Probably God doesn't want you to give everything that you have and put it in the offering plate. Everybody understand that? Okay. But there's something about wanting to give everything that you have that makes it so that God will take what you have and show you how to use it for His glory. And that brings us to our second thing. You can give by putting, by giving it to the Lord, by giving it to the ministry, by giving it uh, to things that you know God wants you, by, by in other words, giving it out. But in our example in the text this evening, what do we see? We see that the people were restrained from giving everything. After they gave, God gave them wisdom, and they said, this is fun. This is the best thing ever. And what did they want to do? They wanted to give more, and people kept giving until they had to be stopped. And the word is restrained from giving. I love that. It's just a beautiful picture. They literally had to be forced to not give. And my question is, what motivated that kind of a heart's attitude? And the same people that are always the bad guys. What caused that? Was it the prosperity gospel? I mean, they gave and they came home and they were full of it. No, my friend. God did something in them. God did something in them. And it made them realize when God has something, it's a lot better than when I have it. Now, Christian, listen to me for just a minute. We'll be finished this evening. You give God what you have. It might be God wants you to put it in an offering plate. It might be He wants you to put it in the mail and send it to a ministry or to an individual or He wants you to use it in a particular way. You give God, you give God what you have. Listen to me now. But you make sure you give God your heart. You know something God will do in your life? If you have a heart to give, God will give you a wise heart. Friend, it's the most wonderful thing because the Bible said when God gave these individuals wisdom that they knew how. In other words, they were able to do things they weren't physically capable of doing before that because they didn't know how. And because they gave 
really the, everything to God. God gave him a heart to know how. Now this is neat, isn't it? You ever wanted or felt like God wanted you to do something and you had to say, but I don't know how? I have. I've been, I listen, in the ministry, I want to say almost everything I've ever done, I didn't know how. But I could say a lot of things in life. I don't know how. I didn't know how. But I gave God what I had, and God gave me the wisdom to know how, and guess what? I'm not God forsaken. In other words, He didn't take what I have, leave me alone, and I have nothing. Matter of fact, the more I give to God, the better condition in general I am period. The more I know how, the more I have to give, and the more I get to experience what it is to know God's goodness. I'll tell you, it's a great thing to come to a place when you just want to give God everything because He just does such great things. Sometimes God will restrain you. I had far rather have to deal with people that are too generous. You ever see people are too generous? I mean, they just want to give everything. And I'm talking about generous with other people's stuff, but just generous with their own thing. You, do, you, you ever worry about the generous people sometimes? Like the guy just gives everybody everything. You ever notice he's always okay? You ever notice a generous guy always just seems like he's okay? He's like, man, you give that away, you're going you're gonna to go broke. What are you going to do? What are you going to eat? What are you going to... And he's always okay. More than that, he's got things that God's doing in his life that he wouldn't have otherwise. He's got God with him. He's got God's wisdom, and he knows how to live. And he knows how to give. And here we find a great example of God's people, national Israel, responding and really with a perfect heart in this matter given to the Lord. This is even after the golden calf. And they please God by it. And here you have, you get to see a picture of God's heart. When you give God what you have, God shows you how. And God gives you a heart of wisdom. What a wonderful thing that is, isn't it? <clears throat> Friend, God isn't trying to bankrupt you. He isn't trying to get everything you have. He's not just trying to, you know, figure out a way to suck you in and to plunder you and leave you desolate. No, friend, He's just trying to use your life and show you how to do things you'd never know unless you gave it to Him. Has God ha does God have your life? Does he have your possessions? Does he have your things? If not, give them to God and see what he'll do. See what he'll do. Father, thank you for what you've taught us this evening. Help us to practice it and live it. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.